Clive, and thanks very much for organising this day here, um, and to the Society as well. Um, great to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you um, uh, um, quite a bit about what the military are doing, what defence is doing to meet its obligations under the Hague Convention uh, 1954. And the first thing is, what is cultural property? It's defined by Article 1 of the Hague Convention, and it's all these kind of things, monuments, fine arts, archives, archaeology, architecture, important buildings, important groups of buildings and, and collections. It's a pretty elastic um, definition as well. And um, what is cultural property in a nation is defined by that nation, not by us telling someone else what their cultural property is. So that's a, that presents a bit of an issue when it comes to us identifying cultural property in other people's backyards. So ever since we've started making cultural property, other people have wanted to damage, destroy, and loot it, and that goes through history, and even in the art world today, it's still feeling the effects of the extent of the pillage across Europe during the Second World War. And then in conflicts that I've been involved in, in Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, um, in Iraq, um, and not yet gotten to Mali, but the Brits are going to Mali um, next year, um, damage destruction to shrines and, uh, and libraries there. Syria and Iraq, probably in no small part responsible for the government of the day then putting the legislation before Parliament to ratify the Hague Convention 1954 and its two protocols and really pick a country. Even as Mark Harrison will tell you, this country. We are vulnerable to, um, our, to uh, the theft, the damage, destruction and looting of, uh, of our cultural property. So what's been done about it? Well, um, as we heard from Peter, a number of uh, UN Security Council resolutions, interesting one about Mali 2100, was uh, in Article 16 and 17, it said that the UN force deployed to Mali was to use all necessary means to do, and one of those things was protect cultural property. All necessary <coughs> means to a soldier, sailor and airman means up to and including lethal force. Now that would fall without our current rules of engagement, which prevent us um, attacking people who are just destroying property as opposed to attacking ourselves or, or other people. So there are going to be some interesting uh, legal issues to, uh, to crunch through. In fact, there are a whole load of legal, eth ethical, moral and military issues to crunch through with this, with this legislation. And as you can see, those UNSCRs apply to a number of other um, areas and aspects as well. At the bottom, the International Criminal Court. Uh, Gilles Dutert, who is the prosecutor of the guy on the left, Ahmed al Faki al Mahdi, for offences relating to war crimes committed in Mali uh, for the destruction of shrines and libraries, um, which very helpfully, a lot of these guys put themselves on video saying, Hi, I'm Ahmed al Faki al Mahdi, I'm just about to destroy this shrine, um, here's my digger, we're going to do this now. Well, you know, talk about bang to rights after the fact. Wow. Um, that's been really helpful. And, and of course, a lot of that happened during Syria and Iraq. And you probably remember pictures from the Mosul Museum of people pushing things over. Well, facial recognition technology, let's try and find some of these people on an international basis working through Interpol and relevant agencies to do that. But the International Criminal Court now taking a, a more prominent role in this area. I mean, in some ways, um, there have been in the news recently that, um, that, that defence could be up in, in front of the International Criminal Court for other reasons. Um, here we are trying to get people in front of the International Criminal Court who may be responsible for um, cultural property war crimes. And indeed, we're looking at them with, with the International Criminal Court on um, speedy indictments where we come across evidence and we can get to the ICC, they can issue an indictment, we can arrest the, offensive, the offenders and get them to the Hague. Um, the guy on the right, Ag Mohammed, is currently going through the ICC. Um, he was, he's also up for cultural property war crimes, but um, he's, he's also crimes against humanity and genocide, so he's a nasty piece of work. The International Criminal Court's view on this is that it's unacceptable for a people now to become separated from their cultural patrimony, cultural castaways from their, from their background. Um, and that's a very powerful uh, sentiment um, that, uh, that I think that certainly we would be supportive of. Um, what about the militaries? Well, some of these militaries have been involved in, in this game for a lot longer than we have. I mean, albeit we were going back to the Second World War with the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives sessions. But the moment the legislation came out, Austria, their top left, they have a unit of 28 reservists, primarily doing cultural property protection within the borders of Austria in terms of resilience and disaster relief. The Dutch have a unit of about seven growing to 15, again, just looking within uh, the borders of the Netherlands at the moment. And um, despite the fact that both those nations do a lot of UN work and external work, they haven't actually deployed cultural property protection officers without the borders of their country. Italy, probably the leader in this space, 300 plus military police officers, the Carabinieri play it both ways, very clever game, um, who are doing nothing but protecting the cultural patrimony of Italy. Um, with tanks and helicopters and submarines and, and all sorts of uh, things like that. And those officers are spread across the length and breadth of Italy, living in 
um, the equivalent of grade one listed buildings, so funded by the Ministry of Defence and housed by the equivalent of DCMS and I guess the National Trust and the English Heritage. So I'm very much looking forward to taking over perhaps Kenwood House as our <laughs> headquarters in London and then we'll think of somewhere else or somewhere else. Um, the United States um, uh, were, were heavily involved in that, but there are all sorts of logos underneath that. Um, for, the, for the Pentagon, for the Defense Intelligence Agency, 10th Mountain Division in upstate New York with Dr. Laurie Rush. Um, and then coming down the Air Force uh, Cultural Language, um, uh, um, sorry, Language Center, Cultural and Language Center. Um, and, um, and then the bottom, US SOCOM, Special Operations Command, and USA Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command, Airborne, which is the founding unit of their cultural property protection unit that was recently announced in the, in the New York Times. Uh, the French have, um, uh, on middle left, a legalistic approach to this. Their legads write all the documentation for the uh, implementation of the Hague Convention within the Army de Terre and across the French Defence Forces. Um, but they sent two of their officers on our, our recent course, and they're looking at establishing within their own, within the Army de Terre, a unit, of, a cultural property protection unit. The Poles um, tell me that they are starting a, um, a, a centre of excellence for cultural property protection. It's, uh, the initiative has come from their cultural ministry, but they're reaching out to Defence to try and establish this. And the Australians who also came on our course very interested in, in this space as well, so um, maybe some action um, on, uh, from there as, then as well. Really, I was handed a loaded gun by Professor Peter Stone, um, and I'm not quite sure whether um, I'm shooting myself in the foot or the bullet is neatly going towards the target, or maybe it's a grenade he tossed with me without pulling out the pin and I pulled the pin. But he wrote this article when I was innocently sitting in Army headquarters and I was only reading, I have to sadly admit, this issue of the British Army Review, which ordinarily um, is, a, is a very good cure for insomnia. Um, I was reading it because I'd written an utterly brilliant article all about green energy and how we should be doing more of it inside defence. Um, and I thought I owed, I'm showing everybody on my desk, you know, look at me, I'm brilliant, I'm in print. Um, and um, I came across, well, I, I thought I owed the magazine a duty to flip through the rest of it, and, you know, the rest kind of is slightly history. What, why did this um, make such a, a, a mark on, on me? And I think probably because of my personal background, I've read every book about the, uh, about the monuments, fine arts, and archive sections. Uh, um, during the Second World War, I'd um, worked for 12 years in part with the Art Loss Register, and I now work for our family business and we're art dealers um, across the road in St. In St. James's. So it was a bit of a coup de foo moment, and excuse my French, a uh, bit of a clap of thunder. I rang up the prof uh, the moment I'd read the, read the article, and he apparently now tells the story how he almost fell off his chair, and that someone from the military was, was ringing up. But I just was, I was in so in the right place in army headquarters to do something about this. The concepts branch looks 20 years forward um, at the future environment, what, and what do we need to do to change the army of today to meet the challenges of, of that future environment? Although, of course, this is very current. Um, and um, so we wrote a paper on, um, on delivering a, it's a bit difficult to see, but delivering a, a, um, a cultural property protection capability with, within the army. Um, and in that paper, we posited a number of reasons why it was a good thing to do. Clearly, top right, it's the law. So it's a non-discretionary um, application of the law to the armed forces, part of the law of armed conflict. Um, we also believe we have a moral obligation to the communities amongst which we are conducting military operations, joint armed conflict and obligation, and indeed across the whole spectrum of military operations. It's about influence, it's about reputation, it's about countering adversary propaganda, it's about our own force protection. If we go and park our tanks on someone's cultural property, they're not going to feel very well disposed to us, we'll get bricked, we may get improvised explosive devices, and so forth. And you end up in that cycle of ongoing cycle of conflict, which keeps us in a conflict zone for a lot longer than we anticipated being there through our own fault. Um, so that improved cultural understanding is clearly vital. Understand um, what, uh, what the, the, the cultural background of the people you're, you're working um, around is all about. Preventing threat finance is we don't want looting to happen. Looting means that people are taking objects out of our area of responsibility and we are legally obliged to prevent, prohibit and stop damage, destruction and looting <coughs> to cultural property within our area of operations. We don't want looted objects leaving our area of operations going through cash converters and coming back as guns and ammo, or cash to support the continuance of an adversary's operations against us. So that, there's a whole intelligence cycle there, and that means reaching out to a whole panoply of policing and international law enforcement agencies who were networking 
into. And the final one at the top is, as I understand academic studies, I've seen academic studies, which show that if you do look after someone's cultural patrimony during the conduct of uh, military operations, it affords that community a faster and better chance of recovering post that conflict or post that trauma. And that trauma could be a natural uh, a disaster um, uh, as well. So those are the reasons that, that went in our, in, in our paper. And um, as this paper took two years to whirl its way up to the top of army headquarters, reaching there in, in, in the middle of 2015, um, and with lots of people um, patting me on the head saying, Tim, great idea, lo lovely, no resources, mate, get lost. Um, so uh, it, it, uh, what happened in 2015 is this, uh, is this article, this, uh, this paper, bumped into three-star level, which is a general level in army headquarters. The government then went and announced that they were going to put the bill before Parliament to ratify the Hague Convention and its two protocols. I mean, this whole story is about stars aligning in the most unlikely way, and here was another one just lining up. There's an awful lot of law that already applies to us as service personnel with regard to the protection of cultural property um, during armed conflict. Clearly, the Hay Convention is the overriding piece of legislation. And I think the, um, and U UNESCO have produced a really handy little, little booklet written in no small part by Professor Roger O'Keefe from the University of Coney. Um, it is written by, uh, by lawyers. Um, so um, I had to go through it sitting on the number 22 bus and work out what do they actually mean? What, what do we have to do? Um, as a result of um, the legislation, uh, the UNESCO handbook, and, and really the Hague Convention itself is the foundation document from which everything uh, comes and really is the one that we have to get to know extremely well, which is why we're inviting an Austrian brigadier over to the United Kingdom next June um, to talk, teach us about the Hague Convention specifically as, as a unit, and we're extending the invitation to um, uh, the single service league, league ads, the military police and um, 77 brigades outreach group. Um, so when you're going through that document, and don't try and read them all, but I've just picked out a few. So um, I've mentioned it before, military forces are to prevent, prohibit, prevent and stop damage, destruction and looting to cultural property, including that by organised crime groups. Another page, uh, uh, another um, eight things to do. Make sure there are mechanisms in place to ensure that if cultural property is recognised during an attack, the attack is stopped. Well, that's a pretty big ask once you've got the tanks rolling to stop an attack. So how are we going to cope with, with something like that? And I'll come back to that point about there are lots of military issues here to, crunch, to crunch through here. And then a, a final one, consider the impact, and this is a targeting one, impact of incidental damage caused by bombing of a, um, bombardment of a military target close to cultural property. Um, the, um, what does close to mean in the proximity of and does that mean that we can use a different kind of weapon system to attack the, the target we're after? Do we have a different approach angle so the frag goes a different way? There are all sorts of ways, or do we do something different, like we do a cyber attack on that, on that objective and not a, not a kinetic attack? All sorts of different things that we can look at in terms of targeting. Um, the Hague Convention, um, Peter mentioned Article 7 is, the, is, the, is one of the bits of the legislation that applies to us, and, and the two points, two sections there, one is relating to regulations. Have we got cultural property protection in our legislation. It is in the manual of, of military law. It is in our military annual training test. But I have shown the blue shield to two very senior officers in the armed forces. I said, Tim, what's that? What's kind of a blue shield thing for? Um, I said, well, that term, General, you will remember from your military annual training test, the law of armed conflict section, very important, you do it every year, is, um, and the thing is, what we do, the way we lay it out is we have um, four, it's a kind of guess question, you know, you have four different symbols laid out, and which of these four is the one for the protection of cultural property? Is it, um, that? no, it's not, no, no, sorry, it's, it's that one. So um, that points to a significant education piece, and one of our roles and responsibilities within defence is to educate defence about um, the responsibilities under the Hague Convention, in conjunction with our, our legal, uh, legal advisors uh, as well. Um, because it is a whole force responsibility. It's not our job to be the conscience of defence in this matter, but it is our job to remind defence from time to time that they have a conscience and that they have um, responsibilities here with this. Um, second one, establishing a cultural property protection unit, securing respect for it and um, cooperating with the civilian authorities responsible for safeguarding cultural property. And the kind of implied task that underlies this is what is where? Because if we don't know what is where, how are we not going to park our tanks on it, drop a bomb on it, send a, a Tomahawk missile at it? We've got to know the geospatial information and intelligence which supports the successful delivery of cultural property protection during the planning and execution of military operations. 
So um, even before the bill had gone into Parliament, the Secretary of State for Defence stood up and said um, this, uh, that as part of the ratification process, we would establish a military cultural property protection unit. And Michael Fallon was a classicist from St Andrews, and maybe that was part of it. It could also be related to the fact that two days before I had a call from the Army <laughs> Secretariat. They're the bit of the Army headquarters that looks at um, uh, what our parliamentary um, relations. And they called me up as I was working in, in my office down the road here, and said, Tim, um, oh, uh, this Army Secretariat here. And I went, oh God, that's always bad news. Um, and the yeah, um, Secretary of State, and I thought this is getting really bad, has had an urgent question in Parliament about what we're doing um, in, in relation to protecting cultural property within, within defence. And I said, well, the honest answer is we're doing jet squad at the moment, because this was a few years ago. And I said, but we can't have the Secretary of State stand up in Parliament and say we're doing absolutely nothing in this area. So why doesn't he say this? And blow me, if 24 hours later the Secretary of State wasn't up on his pins and saying pretty much that. But uh, I mean, he was a, he, he was a man who, who believed in it anyway. So I think we were, we were kind of pushing it at an open door. There was, as Peter Stone will, will tell you, there was support on both sides of both houses of Parliament for this bill. And it probably went through um, like grease lightning um, quicker than, uh, than any other bill. And just as well, it did go when it did go, because it had been caught up in the, in the more recent events in Parliament, it may not have flown at all. So timing again. So what are, what are we doing in defence? Well, it's not just a, about setting up a cultural property pr protection unit. It's about creating a structure. It's a whole force responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility uh, within the armed forces to deliver cultural property protection. It's like first aid. We know how to shove a bandage on someone, but um, then we need a surgeon. So maybe, I'm not trying to compare myself to a surgeon, but sometimes you need to, you need to call a friend, and maybe we're the friends who, who defence needs to call in, in times. But um, create a policy at defence level. And that's being done now. It's going to be wrapped into the next iteration of our Human Security Joint Service publication, uh, 1325, uh, which is human security. We're creating doctrine at the single service level. The Army have done it already. Um, I guess the Navy and the RAF uh, may be uh, looking at this as well. And that will be uh, the doctrine note for cultural property protection will be published um, early next year. The cultural, uh, cultural property geospatial information intelligence piece is a big one. It involves all those parties. The DGC is a Defence Geographic Centre, UNESCO, NATO, and the US Defence Intelligence Agency, which probably sits on the largest data set of um, cultural property. But I think we need to improve, if we like, the granularity, in other words, the, the richness of the data that's available for us, in, and in more, in more detail. Um, so that we can we can actually deliver the capability. Education, um, I've spoken of already. So we're um, um, one of one of our officers who's here today, uh, Professor Adrian uh, Parker, Flight Lieutenant, Intelligence Royal Auxiliary Air Force, um, is uh, currently looking at um, uh, with our learning development advisors in the armed forces is creating the briefings that we need to deliver at unit level and for senior commanders. Um, in terms of informing the military, and we can either go in, round to every unit to deliver that, or we can ask the, for, um, do it in conjunction with legal advisors and so forth. Training is about delivering cultural property protection on exercises and the work up to operations, and then the, the unit itself, and we'll look at some of these in a bit more detail. So we've done a lot of liaison internally. Um, if you're interested in the badge in the middle, um, working with, with uh, Clive on this at the moment, um, the words respect and protect come from uh, Eisenhower's directives in 1943 and 44. He used the word respect in 1943, and, and, and in fact, he said protect and respect in his directive in uh, 1944. Clive and I think respect and protect um, goes better. And uh, what is the winged ox in the middle all about? It's a badge of St. Luke. St. Luke, patron saint of artists, and everything that we do is about protecting what an artist of some description has created. So. Um, we think that that's probably quite a, uh, an appropriate badge to have. But uh, anyway, looking around there, the huge smoggers board of abbreviations for which I, I do apologise. I think the Russians know more about them than, than I do. Um, but PJHQ, Permanent Joint Headquarters, and they have a Standing Joint Force um, Headquarters as well, which does um, emergency operations, defence intelligence, um, fin financial in intelligence and infrastructure, Defence Geographic Centre, 42 Engineer Regiment of the Army Regiment, part of the Joint Forces Intelligence Group who deliver geospatial information intelligence to uh, the Army and Defence. Standing Joint Command is looking at what happens within the United Kingdom itself, and so that could be a resilience operation, uh, should we have a terrorist issue, or should we have a, a humanitarian aid and disaster relief, the kind of thing when you bring up the Army and can you provide a helicopter. Optang deliver training before going on missions, 
DCSU, Defence Cultural Specialist Unit, Defence Infrastructure Organisation, look uh, after the defence estate. Um, and then we've got a, um, a bit of policing and legal on the, on the left there. Uh, DCDC is a, a Defence Concepts and Doctrine Centre, um, which does our policy and doctrine. And then the, the joint space, we've got the three single services and the top, the top Ministry of Defence. And then um, Clive mentioned the working group, and he said it was small and it is elastic. Um, it, it, does, it does vary as to who shows up. But we've had to develop relationships outside defence, which we hadn't had before, in some very interesting and, and novel places. Top right, there's a whole big policing bit um, to this, uh, with relations with uh, Interpol, Europol, uh, National Crime Agency, um, uh, the International... Uh, customs uh, organization with the FBI uh, art unit with uh, Homeland Security International and their art investigators International Criminal Court I mean it's, it goes on and on and the whole Met police thing um, with the Met art and antiques unit um, and um, <coughs> the National Terrorist Financial Investigation Unit and war crimes war crimes is another big piece that we've already slightly looked at border force um, then some of the NGOs here the Blue Shield the Red Cross and across the bottom are custodians of cultural heritage who have been very supportive and some of their um, membership organisations as well, and the Smithsonian. And then bottom right, we've got the militaries um, who we've been liaising with. Um, <coughs> and then top right, top, um, the top right we've got the uh, other government departments reaching out to the Organisation for Security Cooperation in Europe and the Commonwealth um, and UNESCO beyond, beyond them, as well as Historic England. Um, NATO is in this space as well. They've written a directive uh, on cultural property protection, which is sending them on the road to standard, standardise agreement uh, on cultural property protection. Um, Peter mentioned the booklet that they produce in the CIMIC, that's a civil military uh, centre uh, of excellence in The Hague, um, which is, has been done. Um, and uh, we're cooperating on all those things with, um, with NATO, so on policy, on the um, data and so forth. We established an illicit cultural property trafficking working group. Um, why is defence into this? Because one of the legal obligations on us is to prevent, prohibit and stop uh, looting in our area of operation. So we brought together uh, people from across government uh, and their agencies to look at what is the impact uh, of, uh, of, of looting um, and trafficking. Uh, does it involve the UK and UK nationals? What intelligence can be generated? What intelligence can be generated into, in, into evidence um, in order to arrest and seize things? And what advice can be given to ministers in terms of policies? And then can we recover and repatriate? Now, most of these are without um, the defence's um, gambit. And most of this is about international policing and law enforcement. But we're going to be in the first mile, as it were, and so um, it's our responsibility to stop things happening in that first mile and to reach out to our partners across government and internationally to ensure that there is a coherent, cohesive and cooperative uh, response to illicit cultural property trafficking where it involves the uh, United Kingdom. Information, the, the sort of large elephant in the room, the most fundamental preconditions to protecting cultural property during hostilities are to identify what and where cultural property to be protected is and to communicate this information effectively to those engaged in the planning and execution of military operations uh, in accordance with the UNESCO manual. So the warfighters on the right, from targeteers in defence through permanent joint headquarters to uh, RAF planes, I mean, one of the big advantages these days is, I think, is that everything comes off a plane, everything comes off a ship, it's, it's generally going, knows where it's going. Um, and um, in the Second World War, of course, you just opened the bomb doors and, and fingers crossed that it didn't hit the, the kind of thing because the monuments, uh, fine arts and archive sections produced maps which then had sort of tipexed out things, don't hit this church. And so you just, the fingers crossed as a bomb aimer went across that town that, it, that they, the bombs didn't go there. But it was luck rather than judgment or technology. Now we've got a lot of technology that helps us on the battlefield. We don't want to waste expensive ammunition. We want to put it in the right place to achieve a military effect. Um, and uh, so it's become more possible in more ways to deliver cultural property protection because of the technology. It's a matter of amassing it in the right place to do that. But we get our geospatial information intelligence from the people in the middle, a Joint Forces Intelligence Group, which includes the Defence Geographic Centre, 4-2 uh, Survey Regiment and uh, the UK Hydrographic Office. And we're reaching out um, beyond over the left-hand side of the screen to our allies and to NATO and outside the wire, as it were, into academia and into the nations to um, deliver that uh, cultural property, geospatial information intelligence. But it's, um, think of it from a 
military uh, operational security perspective, we don't want to have to ring up somewhere that we're going to invade next Tuesday and say, hey, by the way, it's Saturday. And um, we, we would like all your cultural property information um, in our data set so we, we don't bomb it when we arrive on Tuesday. And what do you mean you're coming on Tuesday? Um, so we've got um, the, the, these kind of things should be built now um, in times of relative peace um, uh, when we're not all fighting each other um, in, in order that that data is freely available. But it's very sensitive. It might all be in Benny Decker's guide, but if you put a list of cultural property together and put it into a military, um, a military data, data system, then one person's list of cultural property to protect could well be another party's list of cultural property to be taken out. And we've seen that kind of eradication of cultural property in, in Syria and Iraq. So it's, it's sensible, but it's sensitive. And how do we deal with, with those issues? So what we're looking at now is um, utilising the distinctive emblems of the Blue Shield and the Hague Convention um, on our mapping. It's called Symbology. Um, it's been run through our Symbology Committee now. UNESCO say that's fine, you know, you're a party to the Hague Convention. It's up to you if you want to use that and if it becomes best practice um, uh, amongst nations then, then so much the better. But they, they, may, they may or may not uh, go for it with the, the Symbologists, but it, it would seem to make sense to me to use the distinctive emblems because that's what people might see when they're actually conducting military operations. And if you, if, let's say this is a digital uh, mapping layer as opposed to a physical one, one should be able to click on that icon and go straight to what NATO have developed, which is a 30 point schema, 30 different data fields relating to that cultural property structure in terms of where it is, what it is, what it's made of, who's responsible for it, what's in it, movable cultural property, will it, and then, then we can make all the deductions as to whether we need to um, conduct some surveillance on it, whether we need to guard it when we get there, if it's full of important movable cultural property, that is, there's a chance it might be looted. So uh, we're working with NATO um, and our, and internally on those. And the United Kingdom, Historic England, have bringing together all the um, devolved governments to put together the United Kingdom CD-ROM of our cultural property that meets the standard that DCMS have set for um, that cultural property to be protected under the Hague Convention 1954. So when we've got that CD, and in fact the, the data for uh, England and Wales has already gone to defence, um, but when we built the whole data set, then we can send it to NATO, we can send it to UNESCO. Um, and the irony about this piece of legislation is that there's no requirement for any nation to log any data with UNESCO, which one would have thought would be the sensible place for all this data to sit. Where, what UNESCO have is the World Heritage Sites, and there are you know, effectively buttons number of them around the world, um, whereas there, in this country there are something like 15,000, I think, um, in England alone. Uh, items of cultural property or structures of cultural property that meet the standard of uh, the criteria that DCMS have set. So when we built our data set, then we can go to the rest of the world, bottom right, and say, here's our data disk, have you got yours? And if you haven't got yours, maybe there's a cultural diplomacy opportunity for, uh, for DCMS and uh, the Historic England and Cadors to go to those nations and say, can we help you put the legislation in place to build an, a national data set um, and to ensure the protection of, of your own cultural property. I don't know, not really a matter for me, but I'm interested in, in the data that, re that results from it um, because we need it. Uh, the final aspect almost is the Military uh, Cultural Property Protection Unit, which was, um, um, uh, comes about as a result of the ratification by Parliament of the Hague Convention in 2017. The unit was established in the back end of 2018. Um, and we put it into 77th Brigade, into the outreach group, which is in old money the civil military affairs um, uh, um, unit within, inside um, 77th Brigade. So it's a defence capability, it sits within the field army. We look back at two antecedent units that existed in the Second World War, uh, the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives sections, um, both UK and US primarily. There were 50 Brits serving during the, um, the fighting part of World War II who were listed in uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sir Leonard Woolley's post-war report. And incidentally, that report and their standard operating procedures from the Second World War are as relevant to us today as they were when they were conducting operations in the Second World War. Because some things just don't change. History tends to repeat itself. Why would they be any different? Of course there are things that have moved on, like technology and so forth, but how you deal with a problem is fundamentally the same as it was um, in, in, 19, in 1945, although probably some conservatives will shut me down and say, that's absolutely, things have moved on. Well, of course they have, 
but the fundamentals that underlie them aren't. So the, the um, Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives sections um, were responsible for the physical protection of it, and as it became clear in, during the Second World War uh, how much uh, um, had been looted, of course, then they became responsible for identifying the refuges and recovering the cultural property out of them. Somebody once mentioned to me that, Tim, if you sat up in front of a room full of academics and you mentioned that movie that uh, Peter Stone mentioned, he said, you'll lose, you'll lose the room. But I have to say, that movie has done a lot to raise the profile of what this unit did in the Second World War. Otherwise, I'd be having a hard time explaining to it. As it is, I can walk in somewhere and I can say, you've seen the movie? Yeah, I've seen the movie. I'm George Clooney. Okay. <laughs> At least that's what my mirror tells me every morning when I'm having a shave. My wife tells me different, of course. Um, the unit on the right, I hope I haven't lost the room now. Um, on the right-hand side is the Art Losing Investigation Unit. And that was a, a unit of the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner to the Central Intelligence Agency. Their remit was to look at the groups, individuals, and networks responsible for um, the looting, with a view to both restitution and bringing the individuals responsible to account at Nuremberg, where four were arranged for cultural property war crimes, and one was executed. One executed himself, um, and I'm not quite sure what happened to the other two. Um, both these units had a very short lifespan. Um, in, in terms, I mean, the OSS was wrapped up at, uh, immediately after the end of, um, of combat operations, and the, and the, the if you like the war bit of um, the wartime bit of the MFA ANA um, soldiered on for a few years after. But many of those who were involved during um, the conflict themselves have gone back to their, their day job shortly thereafter. Um, but we look back at those two units um, again because many of their operations give us lessons um, and operating practices for today. So when we look at the roles for the cultural property protection unit, we look back at the Second World War, we look at the legislation itself, we look at the experience of our allies, and we look at statements made by the Secretary of State for Defence and Parliament. They all get wrapped into something called the concept of employment, a conic, long document telling um, the armed forces how this unit's going to develop, deliver its capability. There are also, they can get a con use and a con ops and all sorts of other things as well, which I'm sure will come, back, come to write as well. Um, the Secretary of State for Defence then stood up in Parliament a bit later on in 2016 and said the unit will provide advice, training and support to operational planning processes and can investigate, record and report cultural property issues from any area of operation. So that's a quite uh, broad and challenging remit. What does that mean? I mean, rather glib to just write down education. We've got to educate the whole of the armed forces. And if you remember, no, 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 19. Now, this is an organisation that churns quite a lot of people. This is a real ongoing responsibility to educate defence about what our obligations are under the, under the Hague Convention. Training, doing command post exercise and field exercise, defence engagement when military talks to another military, um, are supporting other government departments like DFID, perhaps with humanitarian aid and disaster relief, and, um, and uh, liaison uh, with a wide spectrum of, uh, of other parties. And then during uh, operations itself, uh, targeting and liaison at all levels, and some of those things the Secretary of State for it said, and at the tactical level you can see there, the two items are actually mentioned in the Hague Convention, securing respect and cooperating with the civilian authorities. How do you task it? Through Army Headquarters. Uh, that's the structure of the unit, one plus um, 14 with four Group B reserves. We've managed to swing a couple of posts to the Royal Navy and the Royal Auxiliary Air Force. They need these kind of skills, monuments, fine arts, archives, archaeology, uh, architecture, structural engineering, art conservation, art logistics and art investigation. So we're looking at people with a relevant degree, five years relevant experience in working in the cultural property world. So there are the first six who are in, um, and um, Historic Environment Scotland, a heritage building surveyor, freelance archaeologist, Royal, who's a Royal Artillery targeting specialist, heritage advisor who's an intelligence officer, a professor of geoarchaeology who's an intelligence officer, project manager with English Heritage Army Air Corps, and four civilians um, uh, working for the National Trust, the Museum of London, Oxford University, and, and tell me Dean Heritage Architects. So those are the first ten. The, the ones along the bottom are civilians who are now starting the process of uh, their Army officer and RAF officer um, selection training, which I'll go through. A few more candidates on, on the right, always looking for more people, um, so uh, do call me afterwards. Um, within uh, this was a, at the first training course we ran. Within a month of that, we had someone tr with the working with the Blue Shield training the Irish Defence Forces before a UN deployment. Someone in NATO talking to them about cultural property protection. Um, someone training the Defence Human Security Advisors course. Someone working with the Metropolitan Police on on uh, war crimes. That was the whole course. Lots of people there on the on the right hand side. There were seven different nations, um, and on top of that, there was UNESCO, Interpol, the Carabinieri, Metropolitan Police, two officers from there, uh, Simic Centre of Excellence, um, and uh, and others. 
Um, we were doing the integration of um, cultural property protection and hire planning processes, um, very complicated, actually it's quite simple, but um, uh, briefings on things like humanitarian disaster relief uh, from the French officers on Mali and the Central African Republic and all those other things. Historic England very, uh, came along to talk to us about first aid and drones for assessment. Um, and Nigel came to talk to us about the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives sections in the Art Loot Investigation Unit. We went out on the ground, we did some recce's, we were looking at those things at Hinton Ampner, um, at Fort Brockhurst in Gosport and the Royal Garrison Church in Portsmouth um, in order to understand some of those points above. Um, and then there was, a bit, you know, on the side, uh, we had Heritage of War team down um, and uh, Tim Lawton came down to present the certificates, map room briefer. Because Southwark Park, where we were delivering this course, was Eisenhower's headquarters before D-Day. Um, get an ID card, um, get some badges, big story about that. Um, it took a long time um, to get put a badge on a uniform, but uh, it was important from my perspective, particularly the ones on the, on the left, the big blue shield. When you're in a headquarters, someone can immediately identify what your role and responsibility is within this headquarters. And from my perspective, that was uh, uh, an important thing to do. Um, get some equipment. Uh, we're looking at the standard operating procedures, which I explained before. We've got to do a lot of awareness, training, and um, raising the profile within defense. Um, we have an, on our intranet uh, the Army Knowledge Exchange on which there's a cultural property protection page. Um, the government, uh, or, or um, it was announced by the Secretary of State for Defence that we would have a Human Security Centre of Excellence on hold at the moment. That Centre of Excellence would include cultural property protection if it does come back. I put this slide up as my final slide, um, uh, and my final slide to a briefing at Permanent John Headquarters recently. Senior commanders, what to do, and J1 to 2 are all the different things that we do in, in the armed forces. So personnel is one, two is intelligence, three operations, four kit, five is, um, five is, to try and remember what, five is planning, um, six, uh, comm, seven um, is finance, eight, I know, uh, seven is training, eight is finance, and nine is policy, um, uh, legal, and media. Um, and then I flicked on to the, it was just the idea to give people something to do, and I flicked on to the last slide. And then the th most senior officer in the room said, so Tim, what are the kind of responsibilities here for, for defence? And I went, Admiral, let me just flip back to that side. And then I draw your attention to senior commanders and the second point. Failure can be a war crime. And there was pin dropping silence for a, a, a sort of took three. And then he said, I rather wish I hadn't asked that question. <laughs> um, so th that's what underlies this. There are legal obligations on the United Kingdom Armed Forces to comply with the Hague Convention 1954 for the protection of cultural property in the event of armed, of armed conflict. And, um, and we will deliver. Thank you. Tim, thank you very much for a, a, a very detailed and, and, and meaty presentation. Um, my, uh, my bad, I got the timing slightly wrong for, at the top of this talk, but we do have a couple of minutes for um, some questions arising from Colonel <coughs> Tim's presentation now, and then we'll run from uh, 12.30 through to 1 for, for, the, for the last section. Do we have any questions? Uh, one right at the back, and then one, um, a couple of questions. Please shout, because I'm deaf, I suppose. And if you could, if you could uh, state your name. Hello, I'm John Bow. Um, I work for the Council of Europe on illegal trafficking. So, and I spoke to Council Berber on the phone here in some advice a couple of years ago. But I just want to raise the issue of, you referred to the Metropolitan Police uh, being active here. And you referred earlier to Carabinieri uh, in Italy. There was 300 in the Carabinieri, and there was two here. And when I talked to these two extremely nice police officers a couple of years ago, they'd been seconded to the Grand Prix Priory. So, I mean, although you're thinking a picture of the, the, the more picture, it's, um, there are still quite a few gaps in our civil responses. I'd like to suggest. <laughs> Happily, I represent defense, not the Home Office. Um, so the politic thing there would be um, to say nothing, but what I can say is that um, Interpol have produced a paper which recommends that every Interpol member has a National Heritage Crime Unit um, in, in their law enforcement uh, area. And, um, and I'll just leave that there. Uh, 
again, that message across uh, in, 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 in a tangible way to soldiers. How do you think that's going to work? Uh, thanks, David. Um, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, I think you know, education and training ran, run hand in hand. Um, you've got to do the education before you can actually do the, do the training. So it's, um, it's a long-term delivery of this, but we're, we're, all, we're looking at exercises now. We're looking at a big um, a US reinforcement exercise into Europe next year. We're looking at um, Allied Rapid Reaction Corps exercises and UK 3DIV exercises, because you've got to start somewhere. Um, and so if we, if you like, there's going to be a multi-pronged approach to this. We can produce things like a Defence Cultural Property Protection Handbook, and we can throw that on AKX and probably very few people will read it. We can churn out packs of cards, posters, um, we can do unit briefs that we can put on AKX that the League Ad can go and deliver from the brigade or wherever. But this, this should be part of our, our ongoing, ongoing training. And if you look at what's in our military annual training tests at the moment, there is one question only on cultural property protection, and perhaps that could be looked at, and maybe there should be more. I mean, these aren't um, you know, these are issues that we're, we're sort of pushing um, into defence, into defence on. But I think we need to get out there and get um, get participating in, in exercises because it is a whole force responsibility. Um, so. You can't just show up on an exercise and do it. You've got to be wrapped into the um, military um, events, the main events list. Um, so you've got to be, you've got to be participating in the structural delivery of the exercise. Um, so that's a, a big ask as well for the 15 res reserves. Um, so there's a there's a lot to do for a small number of people. But um, there are also our, our legal officers who can help deliver this training and education and support on on exercises as well. Probably not a terribly complete answer, but we're going to have to get right in there. I think that's a really good question. So what are, what are our responsibilities with regard to the natural environment and, and the natural environments which are protected? And if you look at um, one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, I believe, is the Cornish tin mining area. Well, that's, that's half of Cornwall. And, and what are we supposed to do to protect half of, half of Cornwall um, from damage, destruction, looting, and, and a disruption to, the, to that natural in, environment? Um, and I think these are issues that we'll have to work through. The, the ones that we've got, I've got in front of me are concerning cultural property and, and its protection, but it very soon edges into that whole area of the legislation surrounding protection of the natural environment as well. Uh, and there are other parts of, uh, of the army that may, um, particularly perhaps engineering, that are looking at, um, at those areas as well. But, um, and I will always defer that one to our legal advisors as to um, what our responsibilities are. It could also be a question for us to discuss at the end of the day in the round table. I think it's, it's a very broad issue. Um, Thanks for the question. One more question perhaps. If arising from the paper specifically and then I think we will push on to that. I love the way that my just chat is a paper. <laughs> Specifically, cultural property protection. 
uh, of the map. How that is delivered changes depending on the level of command and responsibility. So you get more of it by the command responsibility increasing. So senior commanders get more uh, in terms of their own command responsibility and their accountability responsibility. But I just thought it would be useful to have, provide a little bit more context because he's doing absolutely right to the big arts, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, of large organisations that do have a large amount of churn because people join and leave. But at the same time, there's some well established programmes that I think the cultural property or if you take a part in. And I think there's definitely an opportunity, I think, here to, here to get the cultural property unit involved, for example, in the overarching governance structures of our training to make sure that you can also help ensure what we're delivering already and join in so that we can help augment that 15 reservists, which, as you rightly said, is a very small number of a very big task. There's a whole raft of other people doing this, and I think we need to work together to make sure that we deliver more. What is needed both legally and legally? Thank you, Matt. <laughs> no, I, I agree, absolutely. I, I think that from our perspective, as Spider-Man's uncle said to Spider-Man, with, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, we have enormous power on the battlefield in terms of the legal, application of lethal force, and um, it's up to us to um, discharge our obligations under a whole panoply of legislation um, in, in accordance with, our, with those obligations. So, and we very much look forward to working uh, across all uh, departments, in, uh, all single services, and with, with the legal um, departments in order to ensure that the training delivered meets the, ensures that our personnel meet the meet um, can meet those obligations when they're called on to do so. Tim, thank you very much.